Hello everyone, welcome wow. to the League of Women Voters event. I, I, my name is Ronnie Metzger. Thank you for coming today. And uh, I have been here one other time. I think I was here on my 61st day after I had been appointed to this position. And on that day, I brought with me the poll pad, which was our newest, latest thing to introduce to Johnson County. Okay, so we're gonna press that right there. Uh, so today, I, I thought maybe the presentation would focus around uh, what have we done in Johnson County in the last three and a half years since I was last with you, uh, because uh, I did show you the poll pad. But before I go any further, I wanted to just stop and recognize we have a very important person with us today. Commissioner Janae Hanslick is here, right on the front row of all things. Let's, let's thank Commissioner Hanslick for being here. And I know a number of, of uh, my friends that are uh, throughout, sprinkled throughout the crowd. It's great to see you, Jill Quigley. We served in the legislature together. I really appreciate it when she arrived because I was the new guy. When she came, she, she got to where I'm, I'm the newest person button from that point on. So uh, we, we got along really quite well and, and uh, enjoyed our time in the legislature together. So today, just to give you, I, I, I'd like to know who we're speaking to. This might be of interest to everyone. Uh, I, I'm curious if there are people in the room from outside of Johnson County. How many are here from, not from Johnson County, you're from somewhere else? Okay, so if this is largely a Johnson County crowd, and if you're from somewhere else, can you shout out what county you might be from? Leavenworth. Leavenworth County. Wyandotte County. Wyandotte County. Wyandotte. Wyandotte. We have one from Missouri, from Columbia that I met. Okay. Bo Boone County, Missouri. Yes, okay. Well, thank you. Uh, so this is largely Johnson County. So uh, for those of you not from Johnson County, welcome. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, take the, uh, I'll, ta I'll take that title of uh, post and, and just welcome you to our county. We love it here. I'm a lifelong Johnson County, and, and uh, just so some of you might not know, there's one other question I wanted to ask, and that is how many of you have worked in a polling place as an election worker, either recently or at some point in the past? Let me see your hands. I'd like to give these people a big thank you. I always like to ask that question because if you did not raise your hand, <laughs> I just happened to bring some brochures to tell you how you can become one. And this is really, really, really important. We have a very high attrition rate for our election workers. Uh, we recruit them and they work a few and then they discover that they can't do this anymore. So we are perpetually in recruit mode for this, and in Johnson County, we need uh, around 3,900 people in our pool, and we'll use about 2,200 in each election. So we cannot be short, we, we can't have an election without election workers, and so this is a critical piece of our process is to constantly be recruiting more folks. So be thinking with me as we go through all of this of the importance of voting, the importance of elections, and who it is that you could recruit to do this. I know that uh, uh, I just saw all the hands that went up, and I've already spoken with many of you who have been a part of our process in the past. But I wanted to just mention those two things. We also brought you some notepads. This is free, no charge. You know, nothing is really free. But, uh, but, but we, we want you to take this home because, oh, it happens to have our phone number and our website and, and other information down at the bottom so that you can access information. Our website has been recently redesigned, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But I wanted to just start off with uh, an, a quick overview of our office and what we do. Uh, we, uh, we have two main sections to what we do. One is voter registration. Without having a list of voters who are the credentialed and qualified voters, you can't have an election. So the basis of having an election is to have a qualified quality list with accurate data of the voters, where they live, what precinct they're in, and it all starts at the very most minute detail. Everything has to be accurate 
cannot be inaccurate. Second part of what we do is we administrate elections. And uh, we run about six to seven elections per year. Next year is a presidential election 2020. But we already have four elections on the schedule prior to the presidential election and the primary. So we already have six on the docket for next year. And there could be more coming. We never know. All it takes is one phone call from a leader of one of the jurisdictions that can call for an election, and we've got another one in 2020. So uh, these are the things that we do. We also have outreach programs. Just the evidence of that today, I'm here speaking to you. This is part of our outreach strategy, is to go speak. I'll speak two to three times a week, and uh, we have another team that's in the booth, in the tent, down at uh, uh, Old Settlers Days in Olathe this weekend. And they're out there registering people to vote. You know that this is voter registration month, right? And part of that I like. I think it's really cool that we put some emphasis there. But the other part of me kind of laughs. Because for us, every month is voter registration month. And every day is voter registration day. And so please don't think I'm being cynical or unappreciative of the project. It is important to put a special effort out. but. Truly, we register people to vote every single day. And we have a number of other outreach programs, but we don't have time to talk about all of that. Everything that we do, uh, we go by the rules. We don't make up the rules. Somebody else makes up the rules, right? Uh, so people call us and they say, you should do this and this and this and this and this. And they want to give us a piece of their mind. And I say, ma'am, you, you can't afford to give us a piece of your mind. You need all of it you have. And, 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 and as, as we're listening to people telling us what we need to do, you know, the, the kindest, gracious, most gentle answer we can give is, you know, that's a great idea. You know how that happens? We don't make the rules. The legislature makes the rules. And so our governing body for making the rules for our statutes come from the federal statutes and also from, uh, from the uh, state statutes. Here's just a quick list of some of the federal acts that have passed in the most recent years. And you, you probably have heard of some of these, such as HAVA and uh, NBRA and uh, the ADA and, and UOCAVA. Uh, but this is just an illustration of some of the federal measures. Uh, in the state laws, we have uh, Kansas uh, Chapter 25 is all about elections. And we have uh, 40, 49 articles in the, in, in, the, in the chapter. We have over uh, 580 separate statutes. We have uh, all kinds of other laws and other chapters within the state law. And we have uh, state rules and regulations. And we have standards. All of these are drafted by the Secretary of State. In the whole body of work that we have here, I call this our rules for how we run elections. There's very little about what we do that we can make up and be creative on our own because almost everything we do, we just go read the statute, the standards, or the rules and regulations, and that's what we do. If we need clarity, we call the Secretary of State's Director of Elections, and very frequently he will say to us, I'm going to defer you to your local chief counsel at which point we call our chief counsel in Johnson County government, Don Jarrett, who then assists us in helping interpret. Now this leads to interesting measures because what we wind up with is 105 counties across the state. When our director of elections says that, we wind up with 105 different chief counsels giving direction, and it could be you know, quite a few different opinions that are generated. And that means that each county is getting slightly different direction on a particular question. And uh, so these, I, I hope, will help answer why things get differently in, get done differently in some counties over others. It's just because this is how we don't make up the law, we follow the law. And when it comes down to an interpretation, we follow the guidance given to us. So that's an important point to make. Our positions were created in 1947 with a statute. And, uh, and so 105 counties across Kansas, four of us have an election commissioner. That's all we do is elections. And in the other 101 counties, the chief election official is the county clerk. And they do everything that the county clerk does as well as run the elections. 
My heart goes out to the, those dear folks because they do a lot of things plus the election. We get to focus just on the election. And that, believe me, is enough to make your head spin all by itself. So uh, here, here are some numbers that would be interesting for you. Election office by the numbers. I do this because I think it's important for us to distinguish the differences between Johnson County, Sedgwick County, Shawnee County, Wyandotte County, and then a lot of the other counties. We have rural counties, we have urban counties. We have some that are urban and rural. We have some that are more affluent. We have some that are not as affluent. We have some that are more highly educated than others. That doesn't make one county better than the other. That doesn't make one county wrong or one county right. That just means we're different. And that's an important thing for us to remember is that every county is slightly different. And we also have cultural distinctives. We have uh, differences of how the voters want to function in their voting processes. I'll give you an illustration. In Johnson County, in 1967, we voted overwhelmingly that we want to vote on a machine. And since that time, we have voted on machines every single election. And we've had uh, mechanical machines and we've had electronic machines. Now we have a touchscreen machine, but nonetheless, for over 50 years, we have voted on a machine. And that's not necessarily the case in other counties across the state. Other counties like to vote on paper. That doesn't make them wrong or us wrong. That just means it's different. It's the voting culture of that county. And so one of the things we need to recognize is we are a state of home rule, and we have the ability to kind of guide and shape who we are within each county and within each city, municipality, and even within our school districts. And so it's important to recognize we are unique and interesting because we want ourselves to be able to control and, and have home, home rule and self-rule. Uh, so these are, these are important things. We have 419,000 uh, registered voters in Johnson County, and uh, uh, that's a, an all-time record, and this is as of the 2018 election. And uh, we have 502 voting precincts. Uh, in, in the most recent general election primary, we had 1,004 ballot styles in an even year August primary over 2,000 races with 3,000 candidates and 13,300 write-in ballots. Uh, so that kind of gives you a little bit of the scope. Might I project forward for two years into, uh, into 20, uh, 20, uh, in, in, into 2020, we'll have 440,000 registered voters. So one of the distinctives about Johnson County is the sheer volume of work that we have to do, whether it comes to registration, polling places, uh, or what. We had 195 polling places, 2,200 election workers. We have 16 full-time workers. Uh, here's the top five numbers. We just recently purchased 2,100 voting machines at a cost of $10.4 million. We have, uh, in the most recent election, it was the third largest election in the history of our county, and it was a midterm election for Pete's sake. I mean, just think what 2020 is going to be like. It's going to be amazing, and that's why we need lots of help. But we, we saw 272,000 votes cast, 65% voter turnout, and I, I think that it's, it's important uh, to, to recognize some of the other things that we've done uh, most recently. So we've added 600 electronic poll books, I thought it was interesting, I was looking at our uh, ePulse, which is our monitoring uh, software, during the election day in this most recent election. Our election workers were checking voters in at the rate of 35 seconds per voter. That is something that was unheard of five years ago in Johnson County, but because of the technology of the poll pad, our election workers now are getting very familiar with this technology, and they're able to check voters in at a rate of one voter every 35 seconds. That's incredible. And that includes those that might have a problem. And so when you think about those that have a little problem, like the poll pad has a problem recognizing a, a last name like O'Reilly or O'Malley or O'Leary with an O and an apostrophe, or it has some difficulties sometimes with a hyphenated last name. And so these, these are able to be overridden and do the manual lookup 
and we can still identify the voter, but that might take a few seconds longer. So included with the problems, we also are able to check every voter in an average of every 35 seconds. I think that's awesome. Tony, yes. about three more minutes. Okay, so we have uh, purchased 2,100 state-of-the-art voting machines. We have constructed a safety and traffic management enhancement uh, uh, project which uh, put a ballot envelope drop box and a ballot drop box drive through lane to adequately and safely handle all of the voters. Uh, we've increased advanced voting in person. This year we added the seventh uh, voting location in Gardner. And uh, we have seven consistent locations throughout the county. 60% of the voters that voted in the 2018 election voted early. Uh, we have improved the election worker training they each receive five to seven hours of training. Uh, we've updated our election office uh, web presence. Uh, we have almost a million people that hit our new webs, newly designed website in the, uh, in, in the first year that it was designed. And uh, we think that's pretty outstanding because there's a lot of information there that indicates people are coming. We reorganized the election office recently uh, we transitioned to local municipal elections, moved from spring to fall, and we initiated post-election audits. There are new statutes, new rules and regulations, and uh, we were able to uh, process through that. We, had a, we were the only county in the state that had a full county primary in this last uh, August election. And we were able to do this, and uh, I thought it all went through very well. Kathy was there to observe it. Uh, Commissioner Hanslick was there to observe it. This is something we can talk about later if you want to talk about our student election and student engagement and the partnership with the schools. I think you'll be real fired up about this, but we don't have time to talk about it. I just want to cite for you our future challenges, population growth, the education of the public, always a big challenge. That's why our website is critically important. Election worker attrition, I mentioned that voting machine learning curve, 100,000 of our 400,000 voters still have not yet voted on one of our brand new machines. We uh, keep track of that because it's, it, it helps us to know what the problems might be. Uh, the uncertainty of federal and state uh, legislation plus judicial rulings. We got a judicial ruling about 72 hours before an election one time, changed everything about what we had to do. Uh, this does not seem like that set us up for success, but that's what we have to be ready for, to preach, pray, sing, or die on a moment's notice. And then we have uh, significant issues with unfunded mandates. We have cybersecurity issues, general security issues. Uh, we have uh, the implementation of Senate sub for Senate Bill 130, also known as the Vote Center Bill. We're going to be talking about that later during the, stump the band session that's coming up. So I'm looking forward to that. So I say questions on my slide, but that really is a, a, a cue for me to stop because after Bruce and Tabitha get done, then we're going to have Sam ask us a bunch of questions. And it's been my pleasure to make this initial presentation to you. Up my presentation, I would just put the plug that my son's team won by a landslide. <laughs> <laughs> um, I kind of figured that I was going to be speaking to a well informed crowd. I kind of have a presentation that I use. Sorry, thank you for the cue. I have a presentation that I use when I go and speak normally, but it has a lot of the same information that Ronnie shared, which I'm glad he did. But I kind of took that out anticipating one of the other two would, would touch on a lot of that information. So I kind of thought I would focus more on what's different in Sedgwick County necessarily. I mean, I'm assuming you all know when the voter registration deadline is, and I'm not talking to high school students that I need to invigorate. And, I mean, you guys are getting there already. So I'm, I'm assuming you're going to be better at this than I need to worry about. Um, so in Cedric County, I just thought I'd go through what kind of districts we have. We have four districts, of course, president, two U.S. Senate, and one uh, U.S. representative. We have 40 state offices that we do, of course, governor, secretary of state, attorney general, commissioner of insurance, treasurer, three state board of education, nine Senate districts, and 23 state representative districts. Um, we conduct elections for 50 judicial districts. Uh, the Supreme Court and Court of Appeals will be the same across all counties in the state. 
uh, but we also have our district attorney, and then we have 28 district court judges that are elected in Central County. I believe that's different from how you do that in Johnson County. Um, for some unknown reason, eight of them are on the midterm ballot, and 20 of them are on the presidential ballot. So by default, I have 20 more offices on my ballot than any other county in the state in the presidential year, which is highest turnout. Uh, so obviously, length of ballot is always a big concern for us. We have 10 county offices, five county commission, you have clerk, treasurer, register of deeds, sheriff, and then we have fire district. And we can touch elections for uh, 20 mayors, because we have 20 cities, uh, 37 city council districts, two drainage districts, 11 improvement districts, we have 20 school districts, and 26 school member board districts. We have 26 townships, we elect three officers for those, so we conduct 78 different elections for the townships. Uh, we have, I believe we actually added two precincts since I updated this number, I apologize. We have like 453 precincts now, but a roughly you take that with two precinct committee positions per major party, and we're conducting over 1,800 precinct committee position elections in the even year primaries. Uh, for a total of over 2,100 district slash offices we conduct elections for in Cedric County. Um, Apparently took out my slide. We have about 300,000 registered voters in Cedric County. You probably want to know that. Um, we anticipate that increasing to around 320,000 next year. Um, so we are not Johnson County size, but I also don't have the budget and staff that Ronnie has, so just kind of want to plug there. Um, <laughs> um, so we have our voting options. We have advanced ballots by mail. Something that we do in Cedric County, which I don't know is is totally unique to us is we have a really aggressive uh, voter information effort in our even year general elections where we send out a, a voter information flyer to all of our voters that has a pre-filled out absentee ballot application. It's barcoded to make it easier for us to process back in our office. All the voter has to do is sign it and provide their ID number. Um, there has been some discussion about funding for that in the past with the County Commission Board. They gave me all the funding I requested for 2020 with no pushback, yay. So we are good to go. Um, but that allows us to offset with uh, not having as many polling places because more people are voting by mail. Um, of course, our military and overseas ballots begin going out 45 days prior to the election. I will mention one of the things that we need to be watching, and I will assure you the Secretary of State's office is already on this, and nationally, election officials are on this, but something that you all should be aware of is that it appears that in October, the U.S. is set to withdraw from the United or Universal Postal Union, which could very easily cause a disruption for the delivery of mail to our military and overseas voters. So we are currently um, at a national level that is being worked on. We have currently reached out to all of our voters who have requested a ballot by mail and given them information as to how they can get that electronically so that we can hopefully get that corrected. We've already actually had most of them correct that before we begin mailing ballots for the November 5th election. But that is something that should be on all of our radar. It is very much on the radar nationally for election officials, and we're all aware of it and working on it. Um, early voting in Cedric County, we start early voting 15 days prior to each election. Some of the small elections, that means we have election workers sitting there doing a bunch of busy work for us while no voters come through the door. But we always keep it consistent to make sure that the voters know when we will be open. Uh, we have, right now, we have 16 early uh, satellite locations across Sedgwick County. Um, well, Ronnie has seven that are open much longer. I have more that are open for fewer days, so we kind of offset how we do that. Um, so we have our 16 early voting locations in smaller turnout elections. They'll be open Thursday through Saturday prior to the election. And even your general elections, they will be open Tuesday through Saturday. Um, we also conduct early satellite on spot days. Uh, I call it a little bit like mobile voting. We go to Envision, two locations that they have in Cedric County that is a service for uh, visually impaired voters. And we also provide early voting at the Cerebral Palsy Center, so those voters do not have to try and get transportation to the polls on Election Day. Um, we have 78 Election Day polling locations in Cedric County. Um, our voting equipment, we use ballot marking devices. We have the, the machines look exactly, almost exactly the same as what you use, but we use them in a slightly different configuration. So you use the ballot marking device, make your selections, it prints out your ballot, 
you can verify that and you take it to a separate machine for it to be tabulated. So it's two separate machines. Um, it's the same thing, just slight different variation of how it's set up. We use the exact same software, just <laughs> different versions of the machine. Uh, so each ballot is scanned. We either have one or two optical scan devices at each polling location, depending upon how many uh, voters we expect. We do provide paper ballots at our locations, uh, but we try to encourage people to use the voting machines because it does verify the ballot and because it keeps them from making a mistake like selecting too many candidates or things like that. Um, we also have our high-speed ballot tabulator, which is really wonderful, and I begged my husband to let me mortgage my house for for years before the county paid for it. We went from, uh, and, and this is a little difference between you know, how Johnson and Cedric have done things for years. I'll give a little war story for Johnson. They used to have to read every single ballot through one at a time through a set of tabulators. We had two high, high speed, you know, in quotation marks, readers that if we ran them for 10 hours a day with two teams of people nonstop, we could get about 7,500 ballots read through. Our current machines is rated at 10,000 ballots an hour. Uh, we cannot run it at 10,000 ballots an hour because we have a lot of auditing that we do between each batch, and so we slow it down, but it's capable of a lot more than what we can do. So it is wonderful. We love that machine so much. <laughs> and it will also help us sort out and find the ballots we need to audit when we're doing post-election audits in large elections so that we uh, can find the ballots quickly and then perform the hand audit. Um, hey. Segmented right into the next slides, like I meant to do that. Uh, beginning in 2019, we conduct post-election audits for each election. And so far, we have uh, conducted four elections uh, this year, so we have conducted four election, uh, post-election audits. I'm sorry. Um, how are we preparing for 2020? So this is kind of a bit of a comparison, similar to what Ronnie did from 2016 to now. Uh, we purchased new equipment in 2017, and we increased the number of voting machines by 300. Because we have the touchscreen devices are not actually tabulating ballots, one of the things that's absolutely beautiful for us is we can reuse the same touchscreens that we used during early voting for election day. So even though we increased by 300, it actually gave us another 200 on top of that because we can reuse those machines. So that, that's, a, that's an advantage that we had. Uh, and I will say when I bought the, the system that, that Ronnie has, wasn't even certified yet. So it wasn't even something I could even make a decision to buy. Uh, we have added 15 polling locations since 2016. This has been on my radar since I became election commissioner. Back in 2006, uh, the county went from over 200 polling places down to 63. Um, and that I was a poll worker in the year that that happened. And it was not a pleasant experience for the poll workers or the voters. And so I knew coming in that it was going to be one of my projects was to add polling places back in. However, we did not have enough voting machines to do so until we bought more voting equipment. So it had to wait until we bought new equipment. So we are adding. We have now hit the max that we can actually fit in our office in our warehouse. And so we can't add more until we get more space. So, but we've added 15. We've made progress. And we've reconfigured our office. We remodeled a whole room where we took all of, uh, we had a bunch of office staff in a room. We took them out and actually filled our whole lobby with cubicles because it was not working for our early voting space. We've turned that now into office space. It also restricts access, so people can't just come into our office anymore. They have to be allowed in. With remodeling this room, we knocked down three walls, took out a big old long built-in cabinet, uh, removed asbestos and black gold. So that's a good plus that now we're not breathing that. We are in a historic courthouse. So. Um, and that will allow us to fit about twice the number of voting machines in our office than we've ever been able to fit before to make room for 2020. Um, all of this is kind of a band-aid. We are on the county's uh, capital improvement plan to have a new office space and warehouse because we're just growing faster than we can keep up with. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I spent two hours yesterday looking at buildings, and let me tell you, that is fun. <laughs> um, it's not my money. <laughs> um, so we have a, a strong focus in our office on cyber and physical security. We have done a lot of work on physical and cyber security over the last couple years. For 2020, we are adding a 17th early voting location. We are extending our early voting hours. We have gotten permission from the County Commission Board to increase the number and pay of seasonal employees in our office so that my staff can actually sleep at night. <laughs> um, we are also partnering with Wichita State University to create a paid internship program for their political science division. So we will have at least two interns next year that we pay $12 an hour 
who will be in will be students from Wichita State. I'm very, very excited about that. In fact, I go speak to their class Tuesday. <laughs> And then, as I already mentioned, we have an aggressive voter information campaign in those general elections. I did forget to mention, so that, that has the get out the vote effort on voting by mail. It also has a list of all of our early voting locations and times, and then a reminder of what their election day polling place is. Yeah, yes. Okay, I can talk fast. <laughs> um, what are our concerns? Actually, I think this might be my last slide, so we might be okay. What are, our, what are our concerns coming into 2020? We have a long ballot. Depending upon where you live in Cedric County, we have between 44 to 47 races per ballot. And that increases the time it takes someone to complete the ballot. Compared to 2018, they had an average of 23 offices on their ballot. Because of those 20 district court judges, we now double in a presidential year. Uh, I think Ronnie used the term, it kind of sets us up for failure. <laughs> so when you're talking to people from Cedric County in person, <coughs> Senate and the House. No, yes, 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 yeah. Um, we're very concerned about misinformation campaigns interfering with the election process. I can't tell you how many times I am on social media. I spend more time on social media than I actually would like to because I am constantly sending messages to people privately saying that is not true, that is not true, that is not true, and why did you post this again? I just told you last week that was not true. Um, and you're the screenshot of me telling you that. Um, <laughs> I'm passionate, sorry. <laughs> um, our concerns for 2020 also obviously include the changing cyber and physical threats that are occurring. Um, space needs are a concern for us. We have one uh, loading dock in our, in our warehouse, so on that Monday morning before the election, we begin vote, uh, loading our voting equipment at 3 o'clock in the morning so we can get the, um, the machines all loaded and ready to be deployed out. Hopefully in a new place, we will have at least two loading dogs. Um, where our unemployment rates in Cedric County are very low, which sounds really great, except that means there's fewer people available to work the polls or to fill seasonal positions for us. So that is a challenge that we have coming into 2020 that we are concerned about. Um, I, I wrote down a couple. Oh, I was going to just mention, I know Ronnie did his plug for election workers. If you have any friends or family that live in Cedric County, <laughs> please feel free to send them our way. <laughs> Okay, I did bring a PowerPoint presentation. It wouldn't load. So I have the disadvantage of having to go from paper, but fortunately I did bring copies of my slides. So hopefully you will be able to follow along, share copies of the PowerPoint presentation with each other, because sometimes it's easier to say, see things visually than it is to try and remember in your head, particularly when I start throwing a bunch of numbers at you. Um, that's important. Now, I do have the advantage of being last in that Ronnie and Tabitha basically covered a lot of the things that I would needed to have covered, and I don't need to cover them anymore. <laughs> but there are a lot of, sim I just want you to know, there are a lot of similarities from county to county. Those similarities, though, are based on an economy of scale. I'm about one-fifth the size of Johnson County. I'm about one-fourth the size of Sedgwick County. So that gives you an idea in terms of economy of scale of what the scope of my issues are. Uh, they're not nearly as complex. But also I don't have the staff that they do. So that changes things. Uh, I didn't hear it mentioned, but the per this year we have primary election on August the 6th, and our general election is on November the 5th. That November the 5th general election is important. If you don't, didn't realize it, it's important. That's when you elect your county commissioners. That's when you elect, in our case, the members of the Board of Public, Public Utilities. It's when you elect school boards. And we have four, four school districts in Wyandotte County, so it's all important. Uh, and then, of course, there's two cities, City of Bonner Springs and City of Edwardsville, that are electing their city council councils, and in the case of Bonner Springs, they're also re-electing their mayor. So every one of those races is important. And when you think about your tax base, 50% of your taxes are usually taken by the city, city county. The other 50% of your tax base is your school district levy. So does it matter who's on the school board? 
You betcha. Pay attention. Who are they? What do they do for you? There's a lot of things that candidates will say they do, but are they really doing it? It's important to know. Since we're already done with the primary election, I'll just cover the general. Uh, on November 4th, I'm dead fifth. On November the 5th, our general election, we have five races for Unified Government Commissioners. That's five out of ten. We have the UG Register of Deeds on the ballot. We have three races for the Board of Public Utilities, KCK Community College, four trustees, four members of boards of education for each one of the, the four school districts, uh, and as I mentioned, Bonner Springs City and Edwardsville City. They're city councils and Bonner Springs mayor. Now, demographic in Wyandotte County, not anywhere near as extensive as what you just heard, but I have 84,417 registered voters. 84,417 voters. Now that's going to be important because, because the other slides that I'm going to talk about, remember that number, 84,417. Out of that 84,000 plus, only 76,511 are active registered voters. Active. There is another category called inactive. Well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean they didn't vote. What it means is that we have evidence, meaning notification from the U.S. Postal Service, that that voter no longer lives in our county. They are not removed from the voter rolls unless they tell us to remove them. And if they don't tell us to remove them, we send a, a thing called a confirmation card where Many of those confirmation cards never get returned to us, so even though we know the person lives outside the county, they have up to four years to come back and vote and become an active voter again. Four years before they're removed from the voter roll. Uh, that's state law. Um, registrations by party, demographic. 49.4% of my county are registered with the Democratic Party. 49.4%. A round number, just say 50%. I have 31% of my voters who are registered as unaffiliated. They did not declare a party affiliation at all. So we're, we're at this point now at 50 and 30. That means that only 20% of Wyandotte County population is Republican. So it's 50, 30, 20. That's an interesting distribution in my county. Voter turnout in 2017, which was the last local election, I had a turnout in the primary of 18% and a turnout in the general election of 24%. What does that mean in terms of raw numbers? Go back to the original number that I told you on numbers of voter registration. That means in that primary election in 2017, 59,000 plus voters did not vote. Did not vote. Didn't care enough to come out and vote. 24% turnout in the general election. That means 55,192 people did not vote. Moving on to 2018. Primary election, we had a 25% turnout, which was about the same as the primary turnout from the previous the general election turnout from the pre previous year, but in that election, a 25% turnout, that means 60,439 did not vote. It's a lot of folks. The general election, we had a 51% turnout, but that means 40,654 people did not vote. In 2019, the primary turnout was dismal. We had a 9.7% turnout, and that equates to 69,000, nearly 70,000 of the, of the people who are registered voters in the county did not vote. And remember, the number of registered voters is 84,000. Are those elections important? Yes, they are. Where are the voters? I wish I knew. In the general election, if the statistics hold true, I'm looking for a 24% turnout estimated, and that will mean that 56,251 people will not vote. That's a lot of folks. 
a lot of folks. Now, one of the things that drives that, what groups like this and political parties and candidates always look at is, well, I need to get out there and do voter registration. Voter registration, voter registration, voter registration. In 2008, big election, right? Anybody remember 2008? Yes. Big election. We had, and there was one campaign in particular that was very aggressive about getting people registered to vote, and they were going door to door in the county. That resulted in 25,000 voter registration applications being submitted to our office. An appalling figure. 22,000 of 25,000 were duplicates. They were people who were already registered. It only resulted in 3,000 new voter registrations. And that's in 2008. 3,000. The sad thing is, you look at the numbers, in that same election, 35,000 people who are registered to vote didn't vote. They didn't care enough to show up. And it's appalling. Particularly, and I look at numbers, 50% of my county is Democrat. Where are they? Why aren't they voting? That's an important election. Now, I would have to say that Sharice Davids did, in this go around in 2018, did a pretty good job of reversing that number and actually getting some interest generated among the voters in Wyandotte County. But I'm sorry, that's exactly what candidates have to do. They've got to generate the interest and turn out their supporters and make sure that people vote. So my encouragement always is if you're out there doing voter registration, your first question should be, are you registered to vote? If the answer is yes, you don't have to do a voter registration application. But what you need to do is engage with that voter and encourage them to vote. Talk to them about what the issues are. Talk to them about who the candidates are. And make sure that you've done your level best so, so that they vote. Now, there's lines that I can't cross. I cannot advocate for a particular candidate. I can only say, please vote. I always hang that challenge out there to the media saying, I would love it if 100% of my voters in my county would show up. Because from an election administration standpoint, I have to be ready as if they were. We're ready. But it is, it is a shame, a crying shame, that I've got election, more, we've had situations where I've got more election workers in the polling place than bother to show up. And then the, the voters that do show up say, well, why are these all these election workers sitting around? Well, people aren't coming to vote. It's really that simple. Um, so, what can you do? Get involved, vote, and encourage your neighbors to vote. And I assume that this group probably votes in totality, I would hope. Um, but it's you, you walk your neighborhood. How many of your neighbors are not voting? Uh, the, party, the, the, the parties in Wyandotte County have the ability, in, a, in any county for that matter, you can get voter history. And you can see who's voting. You can also see who's not voting. And if they're registered to vote, why aren't they voting? Um, okay. What can you do? Get smart. Learn about the candidates and the issues. Which candidates represent you? Are you sure? Attend some meetings. Go to your county commission meetings. Go to the meetings of the, of the boards of education. Go to KCK Community College, the Board of Public, Public Utilities. Critical. Know where to go to vote. In our county, you can vote, and it's true of them too. In Kansas, you can vote in advance. In Missouri, you can. Nope. You can vote an absentee ballot, but if you want to vote in Missouri, you have to vote on election day. That's true. In Kansas, up to two and a half weeks before an election, you can early vote. In 20 days before the election, we automatically mail ballots to every voter who has applied to receive a ballot by mail. In 2008, my number of advanced voters that voted by mail was about 20,000. 2018, that number had slipped down to 5,000. And to deal with that, what I do is before every election, I will send out a letter 30 days before the election 
telling the voters what their voting options are. And the back side of that letter is an advanced ballot by mail application. We don't get them back. And it's, it, it's really sad that we're not getting those. Um, know what, who and what's on your ballot. We have a question that's coming up on this ballot. It's a census adjustment question, which many of you may not know anything about. I brought a handout that's available to anybody that wants one. I think there's, I brought 50 copies. What's important about this census amendment? Kansas is the only state in the entire union that adjusts their census to eliminate people who are students or to eliminate people who are in the military. No other state does that. No. Well, guess what? When you do that census adjustment, it reduces the number of voters in Kansas. And it affects your census. What does census affect? The amount of money that your county gets. So the purpose of this amendment is to, to do away with that census adjustment so that we get full credit for everybody that's in our counties according to the actual census, not according to an adjusted number that makes that number look smaller. So I can't advocate for or against, but having explained it, I would hope... <laughs> I would hope you'd have a pretty good idea now that you're equipped with the facts of what you should do. And one of the problems that we have with constitutional amendments on the ballot is they produce the entire constitutional amendment and there's this little blurb at the top that explains what that amendment's about. Nobody reads that little blurb. What they're trying to do is read that entire amendment and it takes up the entire backside of our ballot. And it's only changing that census adjustment. It's the only thing that changes. Okay. Um, on the on the handout slide that I have, I have a number of websites to include the Secretary of State. There's a website called VoteView, and I have two websites for the Wyandotte County Election Office. One is the official website that's through the county, and just bear with me. The one for the county is www.ycokck.org slash election. A lot of words. So I created my own website, which is simply Wyco Votes. <laughs> and if you go to Wyco Votes, you can link to anything that's on the official website. I also had a slide that ended the said questions, but now's the time. And if you want the handout about the census adjustment, it's on this table right here. Okay. Let's get started with this. Only about half hour for questions, so we're going to get right to them. First, uh, thanks, Kathy, for inviting me. You know, my mom was an election judge in Johnson County uh, for 50 years, so voting is near and dear to my heart. So being here with uh, all of you election judges and voters today is a real treat for me. Uh, the first question is, uh, and I was thinking this is uh, uh, in a sort of a different fashion, but uh, what's being done to ensure voting machines can't be hacked? Uh, and in, uh, in the way I formulated the question in my head is, uh, what keeps you guys up at night? What makes you pace the floor uh, worrying about what's going to happen in the, uh, in the election? Remember, we only have a half an hour, so try to keep your hands up. <laughs> Ronnie, we'll start with you. Sure, our, our voting machines are not hackable. They are not connected to the internet in any way, shape, or form through modem, internet, Wi-Fi, uh, any kind of connectivity. They are hardened and air gapped. So there's no way that nefarious efforts can occur with our voting machines. It is the latest technology. Bruce, Tabitha, and I, all three, uh, have the same base model. They're each one configured slightly differently because we got them at different times. There were new things, new features that were added as time has gone by. So we have the most recent edition of the Express Vote, but they are the safest thing on the market today. Is that short enough? Yes. I can answer more detailed questions if you want to. Um, I, I 
don't mean to disagree with Ronnie, but I take a slightly different approach. I believe anything is hackable. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I don't. Now, please just understand, I believe we are the latest and greatest technology, and we have the best thing we can, but honestly, if, if, if you give somebody the keys to the kingdom for NASA, they can hack NASA, okay? So if they are given physical access and have, have the time and the ability, it can be hacked. My job is to make sure that never happens. And I believe that's where Ronnie's going with we're standing in, in between that gap and making sure that doesn't happen. To, to follow up with that and, and to concur with what Ronnie said, we have so many safeguards in place. We have cameras, we have alarms, we have motion sensors, we have security seals that are barcoded that are compared with the security seal on or the serial number on the voting machine on election morning to make sure that what was sealed and sent from the warehouse matches in the morning. And if that seal is broken or doesn't match, that machine is not to be touched and we come and pick it up and take it out of the polling place and it is not used. Um, you know, we have these, these security precautions in place, just like Ronnie, none of us are connected to the internet. It is against the rules and regulations in Kansas for any device that tabulates or lays out ballots to be connected to the internet in any way. We have those air gaps, that is all of Kansas, that is the law, okay? Um, some states aren't that way, but Kansas is. Kansas is, is good on that. On that, um, And I would say to your question, what keeps me up at night? Everything keeps me up at night. Um, from election workers not doing their jobs right, to cybersecurity, to physical security, to snowstorms. Um, and uh, I, I think I covered what I wanted to say, Bruce. <laughs> Well, to what's been said, the only thing I would like to add, because everything is true that both of them just said, the only thing I'd like to add is the difference in our equipment of what we have now, and I acquired my equipment in 2017, the difference is everybody had an aversion to cut screen. That aversion was because it did not previously produce a paper ballot. It was what was called a direct reporting along electronic, so it was DRE. We've done away with that. In fact, they are no longer certified for use in the state of Kansas. What I have is a touch screen. It is simply a ballot marking device. That's all it does. I call it a 4,000 pound pencil. That's right. <laughs> That's all it is. The voter, yeah, the voter marks their ballot on the touch screen. It produces a paper card. You, the voter can look at that paper card and say, yep, that's who I intended to vote for. If it's not, they get a do-over. But the bottom line, if they look at it, it's who I intended to vote, and then they go o over and cast it. One difference that I have, I don't have anywhere near the number of touch screens that the other two, these other two counties have. That's because in Wyandotte County, and this has been true since I've been the election commissioner since 2006, the primary method of voting in my county is the paper ballot. Now, between the touch screen and the paper ballot, I have a 100% audit ability. And when I do a recount, I have a physical ballot for every vote cast. And that's critical to the integrity of elections. Hey, before I move on, uh, you talked about the touch pad to get people registered. And it certainly, when I go to vote, uh, makes it a lot quicker. But that is connected to the internet, is it not? That's true. And so how do we? How are you making sure that that's not tampered with? That's true. And so the, the poll pad is uh, produced by a company out of St. Louis called No Inc. And uh, the the success of the poll pad is that it is connected to a voter database on the, the cloud. Uh, however, the the poll pad database never touches the voter the voting machine uh, data. The, the recording of the votes, they, they, the twain never shall meet. So that when you walk up and you pull out your driver's license, it automatically loads up your voting record from Elvis, which is our statewide voter database, and pulls up your voting record, you're checked in, and then the printer right next to the poll pad prints out what we call the ballot ticket. has your name on it, and it, uh, it, it also has a barcode that has nothing on there except the precinct number where you live so that you scan the precinct number uh, you, you scan the barcode underneath the voting machine that tells the voting machine the proper ballot to load for this particular voter and so that is connected to a cloud but the 
the cloud system is not connected in any way to the voting of, of the voter or the tabulation of their vote. Uh, so it's, uh, th this is hard for people to get a handle on. There's a difference between the pull pad, which is connected yeah. through a secure uh, con connection. Tabitha and Bruce can talk more about this part of it. But it is connected and has to be connected, as opposed to the voting machine that is not and cannot be connected. All right, I'll jump in and talk a little bit more, sorry, about the, the security of the data going back and forth. So the, yeah, yes, okay. So the data going back and forth um, between the poll book and the, the uh, uh, cloud or the server is encrypted. It's 128-bit encrypted. So, it, so if someone were to gain access to our systems, which in Cedric County we provide internet at every polling location ourselves, we own that, and we have uh, those set to secured with our vendors so that they, if you come into the polling place, you can't even see our our internet spots at the polling location. Someone sophisticated probably could, but most people could. Um, so that data is encrypted going back and forth. So if you even grab the data, if you were able to grab the data out of the screen, the stream, you wouldn't be able to decrypt that data, nor would you be able to insert data into the stream because you don't have the encryption code. The, the system would not recognize the data coming up. Is the best way to explain that. Well, and the other couple of other things that I'll add is one, the <coughs> encryption. There's only certain employees that can even access that voter registration database. To access, it requires no less than three different passwords. You go through, to log in, you have to go through three levels before it will even let you into the system. It's a two-factor authentic authentication. It's not only just a password, but it's also you have to have a device that gives you access. And that device is specially constructed, and it, uh, the bit encryption, you know, the, the, the bottom line is, if you don't have that device, and you don't have all three passwords, and you're not on the correct kind of a computer, there's no way you can get to it. Just physically cannot. Now, the other thing that I do in my county is I run a complete voter registration data, database two and three and four weeks prior to every election. Because I want to make sure that when I get to election day, if I say I've got 84,000 registered voters, there better be 84,000 registered voters on my poll books. That's the very first thing I look to. And guess what? We check it again after the election to make sure that there are still 84,000 registered voters on my poll book. Bruce, uh, don't sit down. Uh, the, this, uh, I want to start with you with this question. Uh, communities are becoming more diverse. What are you guys doing to make sure that non-English speakers have the franchise? What are you doing to make sure that they can go above? In Kansas, it's based on census, and there are, what, four counties, I think, that are required to have their ballots in Spanish. Uh, what am I doing? Within my office, I deliberately hired an employee that is, is fluent in Spanish, and that, I'm no, I don't mean it's a lady that took Spanish in high school. I took French in high school. I know so little French, it's not funny. Uh, I spent two tours of duty overseas, and quite frankly, I learned a lot more Korean and a lot more Thai when I was in those countries than I ever learned of, the, of eight years of French in school. But she is fluent Spanish speaker. She can read and write it. Uh, very, very competent. I stole her from the uh, health department. <laughs> they were they hated giving her up, but I got her. And that explains a lot of things to voters, because when the voters come in and they can only converse in Spanish, we can address their issues in their language. Um, in Cedric County, we provide, we do not provide ballots in any other languages. That is ex incredibly expensive, and at this point, we are not required to do that. We do provide instructions and uh, registration cards and things like that at polling places in parts of our pockets of our community that we know are more diverse and might need more help. We also seek to hire Spanish-speaking election workers in those, in those polling locations. We also have a uh, native Spanish-speaking employee in our office. And uh, so the polling places know that if they need interpreter help at the polling site, they can call our office on election day. I will say it is a challenge for us to get interpreters on election day. Uh, they kind of have an expectation that they will be paid a higher rate uh, than the rest of the election workers, and we're not able to do that, but we do strive to do that. This, of course, is a challenge, uh, and we're not required to provide this because we're not one of the four counties in Johnson County. 
uh, but we have uh, an acute awareness of a high number of uh, residents in Johnson County that speak something other than English. It's not just Spanish that we would have to be concerned with. Uh, talk to the administrators of our three major school districts, Olathe, Shawnee Mission, and Blue Valley, 79 different languages spoken in uh, most of these school districts within the buildings. And, uh, and so it's a very complex question. Uh, we do have provisions. If someone needs to have assistance and have help, they can bring someone along. And uh, there are, in, in the statutes, rules, and regulation standards that uh, permit someone to have an assistant uh, help them with the voting process if they need to. They just have to sign the affidavit and go through the proper procedures. And we train our election workers how to make sure that the voter is able to have the assistance that they need. And if I can add, many of the forms that are used for whether it's voter registration or applying for an advanced ballot by mail, there are a multitude of forms that are available to us on the Secretary of State's website that are in both languages, both English and Spanish. And we use them liberally. Next question is, uh, how do you verify accuracy of machine voting tabulation? And I was thinking as you were all talking about uh, post-election audits, so can you just give me some idea of what that post-election audit, how it looks and what you do, uh, Tabit? Sure. Um, well, first of all, we have to randomly select a race, or two races for local elections, and in the bigger years it's more races, and then randomly select 1% of our precincts. <coughs> So we do that the day after the election, and then we have to go find those ballots to audit, which for us, um, and I know not as big as Johnson County, but for us, depending upon which precincts are picked randomly next year, we could be hand auditing over 10,000 ballots next year. So that's a little daunting for us. Um, but we go through and we pull those ballots, and we literally have a bipartisan board that's looking at the ballot, and it's looking at the vote that the person cast on the ballot, and it, they're tabulating those votes and comparing that to what the machines recorded and making sure that the machines are accurate. So every single election, we are going through and we are auditing 1% of the precincts in multiple races. For our primary election, we only had two races, so there was no random selection of the races because we, we just audited them both. Um, but then you're going through and you're verifying that the machines accurately counted those votes. Same yes. thing for you guys? Is about the same, or how does it... How does it how does it differ? Does it differ? It, it really isn't any different from county to county because it's set by state law. So we're all in compliance with state law of what's required. And for us, uh, we, we went through uh, the training. Uh, we actually sat on the committee that helped generate the rules and uh, the, the first draft of the rules and regulation for the audit. The statute that was passed was uh, very general and it was general in purpose and intent because not every county can do the same type of thing or needs the same type of thing. So it's a very general statute. And then the standards were, and the rules and the regulations were written uh, in a very general way. For example, uh, we did our audit uh, in November. Uh, our, uh, the, the selection process occurred on Wednesday morning. And Commissioner Hanslick was there. And uh, where are you, Kathy? Uh, Kathy was also there. One of, the, the, uh, the League of Women Voters sent a couple of representatives to watch. And actually, Kathy is a retired auditor and uh, gave us a nice compliment afterwards saying, you guys thought of things that I had never thought of before. And uh, so we, we designed our system to be as deep and enriched with, uh, with double checking and cross checking as we could possibly conceive. We wanted to make sure that now that we have these voting machines that produce a paper ballot, it is a uh, ballot by ballot hand count. And, uh, and so we, we then had the audit on Friday, and everything turned out absolutely identical to what, uh, to what the count was before. So we, we found no discrepancies. We did two of these uh, audits in, in the year 2019 so far. Uh, just before I move on really quickly, discrepancies in either of your counties? No. You did the audits? No, we've had two hand recounts since our new equipment and done four audits, and they have been 100% accurate. Uh, when will Johnson County implement seven-day voting uh, at any polling place? Why can't this be implemented by November election? I'm assuming this is a state, uh, this is a state issue. Is it not whether or not uh, there's going to be same-day uh, registration and voting? I think that's kind of 
same day registration would take a statute change um, and we're not there at this point so I don't think it, well I know none of us can do same day registration at this point the law doesn't allow it Bruce they want to know how come your website's not that great <laughs> Our website is managed by the Unified Government. Oh, well, I, I genuinely don't have control over its quality. I'm only allowed to do input, which means I can, I'm responsible for the content that's on my website, but beyond that, I can't control anything. Also, uh, they want to know uh, if you can get more money uh, for more polling places. Uh, that's almost the last. Every year I go through a budget process, and in that budget process, and one of the things that happened to us a couple of years ago, the state legislature decided that uh, previously election commissioners had had budget authority. That was taken away from us. The county government is the ones with budget authorities. They give me what they want to give me, and requests for additional, as for instance, I asked for 30 additional uh, of the touchscreen voting machines this year in the budget process. It would have cost the county about $100,000. Denied. Flat refused. And so most of my budget requests are shut down. So it's, it's a constant battle trying to, trying to have enough money to do what we need to do. That's all I can say. Somebody's polling places changed three times in the past two years. Uh, and I guess that all this is for all of you. Uh, why do polling places change? And does it have an impact on voter turnout? Does it lead to frustration where people won't continue on to where they need to, uh, need to vote? I'm going to start with you. Uh, sir, uh, yes, uh, in 2008, we had 284 polling locations. In 2000. 19, we will have 178 polling locations. Part of that was by design, but some of that was because of difficulties within our culture. Uh, we lost 84 school buildings uh, as polling locations. I'm devastated by this because I think it's a long-standing tradition of kind of a marriage partnership between voting and doing so in the schoolhouse. But because of the, the security issues within our school buildings, uh, the shootings and so on, all the violence in the schools, we've had to lock down our buildings and it just is not possible. I would never ask our school administrators to open the buildings up to the common public to come into the building to vote when we're compromising the safety and security of our children. I, I have uh, extreme support for our public schools and the children's safety. And so it's a, it's a real conundrum because we need the schools as a polling location, so we lost them. And I think that we needed to lose them in order for the safety of the children. However, we were able to fill the gap by acquiring other places, such as this building. Uh, uh, many houses of worship from every kind of uh, house of worship that you can name, from uh, Jewish synagogues to... Uh, so, some, uh, you know, the mainline uh, uh, Christian, uh, Catholic, and, and even some of, of those more uh, unique uh, faiths and religions that are also in our county. We go anywhere and everywhere. We're in public buildings. We are, I think we're in four buildings that are owned by a school district. So this is a big conundrum. It's a big difficulty, uh, but we're working the best we can. We also lose buildings from time to time because of a construction project, a refurbishing project, maybe they have a special event or a series of uh, programs that make it not available. We seek to not have an election in a building if we can't have both the primary and the general, uh, but sometimes we're, it's beyond our control. We've had places burned down in between the primary and the general. Well, you can't vote there. Uh, and so these, these are our problems. We just do the very best we can. And the outcome is that the voter has to pay attention because sometimes their polling location will change. I'll try to be really short. I think Ronnie's got a lot of good points to this. Um, we see a lot of polling place changes in Cedric County, and I do think it does affect the voters. Um, it causes confusion. We seek to do our best to mitigate that and to have that 
uh, only change polling places when we have to. Um, we lose polling places for any variety of reasons. One that we used for, I think, over 30 years, the, the owner changed it into a battered women's shelter. Well, I was not going to have the general public going into a battered women's shelter anymore, so I moved that polling place. Um, I have, we've long time had a polling place in our zoo, uh, but our zoo is expanding, and our polling place is going to become part of the construction project. Got to move, my, got to move a lot of voters for that one. Um, it does have an unfortunate impact on our voters, and that's why we try. It, it's also very administratively, it's very burdensome for us to move a polling place. So I can tell you, we don't enjoy moving a polling place either. So um, answer the question, yes, it, it, it is unfortunately part of the process. One of the things we're seeing in Cedric County that is very unfortunate is we're seeing, let me grab your mic, <laughs> sorry. We're seeing a lot of churches, their insurance companies are now asking us for a statement of who's liable if something happens on their property. And when the county is not willing to assume 100% liability at that polling location, now we're losing polling places because their insurance company will no longer insure them because people can just come in, anything's happened, they don't control the environment that they're in. So that's, that's a unique thing that has just started occurring in the last couple of years. I'm hoping it's not a trend that will continue. We, we see that too. Yeah. Um, so that's that's some of our reasons. We also have a lot of petitions circulated at polling places, and if the polling place doesn't like the subject matter of the petition, they will refuse to be a polling place in the future. Last word to you, Bruce. Yeah. If I if I may add, the the two primary criteria that I tell people about what is a polling place, one it has to be ADA compliant. <laughs> It has to be in total compliance with the American Di Americans with Disabilities Act. That's state law. I don't have an option to have a polling place that's not ADA compliant. The other thing is we don't own any of these buildings. The owner of that building has to consent to us even being there. We have churches that change hands. We have building owners that, cha that change. And when the new building owner or that new or that new church comes along and doesn't want to host a post polling place, there is nothing that I can do to force them to do so. So we do have changes. One of the big changes that we had in Wyandotte County, and this happened to us in 2018, very unfortunate time, but the county government decided to take one of our recreation centers that we have used as a polling place for years. They, can, they gave it to a commercial concern. Gave it to them. They became the principal user of that facility. When we went to them and said, can we still use the room in your building that we have always used for a polling place? The answer was a straight no. And it was a firm no, and we couldn't get that changed. So we had to go casting about trying to find alternatives. And, the, and uh, admittedly, the alternative that we were able to finally come up with was not ideal, but where, where we wound up putting a polling place was still within that general area, whereas if I was not able to find something in that area, I would have had to go several, several miles down the road and make that a polling place for them. But it's, polling places are, in a dif are a difficult proposition. And I just want you to know that, that it's not as easy as us snapping our fingers and saying you're a polling place. We're up against 10:30. That's the end of the. Uh, that was the deadline we were given. I just want to say that you know I, I call a lot of public officials, uh, and oftentimes they don't want to talk or they don't call back. Uh, but that's never true for any election official I've ever called. Uh, whenever I call any one of them on the phone, uh, they always call back. So thank you for that, and this would be an appropriate time to thank them for being here.